Welcome to the Women in Music Festival at Mount St. Mary's uh, University, Los Thanks Angeles. We're just delighted to see you here. And uh, we have a wonderful group of scholars uh, to kick off the celebration. Uh, we have from uh, Colburn School of Music in downtown LA, Christy uh, Asal, Asal from USC, uh, Jesse from Cal Poly Pomona, Fredera, who's come in from Oberlin, <laughs> Shauna, who has come in from UCLA, and of course, Rihanna, who is coming in from Nashville. Um, wait a minute, Knoxville. Knoxville. <laughs> Let's give them all a big round of applause. The thought behind this panel is really to provide a frame for our festival. And what I'd like to do is to have each of the participants in the discussion present a bit of their research to you, uh, or their life's work, their performance art to you. And uh, if it seems like the discussion is going in that way, I'd like to have them also talk a little bit about how they got there. Um, so, Let's begin. I'm going to begin just uh, in the order of the line. So, uh, Christy, why don't you introduce yourself, and then we can always come back to any participant for more detail. So, yes, I'm Christy Brown Montesano. I've been teaching music history at the Colburn School. This is my 15th year uh, with the Conservatory of Music. So I teach undergraduate and graduate students, instrumentalists. Uh, who are hoping for a career in professional music making, uh, which is I, it's ironic and it, that I ended up at a conservatory that specializes in instrumental performance since I trained primarily as a vocalist. And uh, my scholarship initiated with my dissertation and, and my book was on Mozart's operas and particularly the women characters. Uh, so, but it's actually turned out to be a very fruitful thing to think about what I'm doing uh, in a larger way in terms of classical music culture in general and with the opera as one lens to look at that, and particularly women's roles in that, not, not only on the stage and what kind of, uh, and the, the role of singers and the types of characters, but in general, uh, how opera, as it's staged, produced, and consumed today, uh, reflects certain values, prejudices, uh, old stories about women as musicians and as characters and as people. So that's some of the things I'll be looking at today in my lecture, uh, both on stage and off stage, the role of women in opera. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Asal Habibi. I'm an assistant research professor of psychology at USC. Uh, I study child development, and my interest is how enrichment programs, and specifically music, can impact child development. Um, the motivation of my work really comes from the observation that we have such an emphasis on STEM and science and math, and once the budget come, cuts come around, the first thing we throw out the door is arts and, and music. So uh, at my institute, which is called the Brain and Creativity Institute, even though we're all scientists, we are motivated to bring scientific evidence of the role of music training in child development. So not only what music does for them in terms of learning music and having fun with their peers and friends and community, but what it does for other uh, functions of their brain, like reading abilities, mathematics, academic achievement, um, and for a sense of how does it make a difference in a child's life to feel part of a community, to have a sense of agency, um, so other impact of music in children. So I've been following a group of children now for five years, since they were six years old, now they're 11. They're part of the music training program that is offered by the LA Philharmonic, the El Sistema method called um, here based uh, called YOLA and we've been comparing that group of children with two other groups uh, children who are primarily doing sports and children who are doing not doing anything specific just going to public school and then go home after and uh, 
today at my talk, I'm going to be sharing some of the evidence of what music has done for these kids who have been in the El Sistema program. And with an emphasis that this is results are not El Sistema specific, any type of music would probably have the same result. Um, and uh, what are we trying now to get that evidence in terms of what in their brain has changed, uh, what, in, what in terms of their cognitive function has changed, and their social and emotional development, and what we're doing now to be uh, communicating these results with uh, public policymakers and educators so we can push for the return of music to their school system. Right. Uh, my name is Jesse Vallejo and um, I have a few different research projects. I've worked on indigenous music in Ecuador, um, but my current research project um, is on mariachi music outside of Mexico in the U.S. So um, I just got back from Cuba uh, from doing some research there. I've been a few times and in Ecuador. Uh, I play mariachi on the weekends. I also teach uh, mariachi at Cal Poly Pomona. I have two ensembles and approximately 40 students um, who've been in the program in just a couple of years. So this is my third year at Cal Poly Pomona, and um, I don't know, I've just been enjoying you know, playing music as much as I can and teaching about it and you know, teaching a bunch of uh, different classes at Cal Poly, like um, World of Music and also senior seminar, you know, things that you go over, um, career preparedness with students and, and things like that. So. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Fredera Hadley, visiting assistant professor at Oberlin Co College and Conservatory, um, where I teach uh, the Intro to African American Music course, I teach, which is a year-long required course for jazz studies majors, and I think that's an important curriculum decision. Um, and I teach other courses on music entrepreneurship, pop music, and um, another course called Black Music in the Hour of Chaos. Uh, my current research, my, my research has always been about how people use genre as an um, indicator of social identity. And so I was looking specifically at um, black professionals in Atlanta, Georgia, and how they use um, that as a way to sort of find tribe and what that means and why it's meaningful. Um, my current um, research obsession, which I think is turning into a project, mm -hmm. is actually um, looking at the work of Shirley Graham Du Bois, the second wife of W.B. Du Bois who also graduated from Oberlin um, in 1934 and then again in 1935, I believe. Both um, a musician and a scholar, she was the first black woman to stage an opera with a professional opera company in the United States. And it debuted to 25,000 people in Cleveland. And um, we're excited because it seems as though the entire score has been found at Harvard recently and they're trying to workshop parts of it. So it's incredible. Yeah, it's incredible. And so... Um, uh, I, I like to tell people that the least interesting thing about her is that she married W.B. Du Bois. Like, that's the least thing <laughs> about who, who, she, who she is and who she was in the world. And um, so, uh, but that's tied to um, two things. One, when you're training to be an ethnomusicologist, they tell you the last place you will end up is in the conservatory because conservatories don't want you. You're the dirty hippies in the building and all of that. Um, I, it's been a delightful surprise that my um, colleagues are congenial and I feel like I have a place um, in the conservatory space. And, um, you know, I kind of tag team with a colleague who does, you know, and this is a, a, a kind of a crude way to divide the world. She does non-American stuff and I do mostly American stuff, right? As if you could hire 20 people to do, you know, um, both either side of that equation. But um, really just thinking a lot about women as musicians. Uh, I teach mostly jazz and classical men who are training to be jazz and classical musicians and we go through these exercises in class all the time, like name some women musicians or uh, who do you consider to be a genius, right? And the accents of women in that conversation is often just mind-blowingly glaring. And I appreciate teaching the conservatory because uh, one of my beliefs is that it's not just enough to know names and to know names of pieces, but how we really continue to give life to people's work, no matter who they are, is by adding them to the canon and bringing them into the repertoire. And so um, I appreciate the opportunity to have those conversations with students. And I tell them all the time, we're not just practicing our art, we're practicing our politics about our art, um, by where we choose to play, who we choose to play with, what we choose to perform, um, all of those things. And so. Um, that's a little bit about sort of my research interests, pedagogical interests, and um, 
sort of my mission, I guess, as the dirty hippie in the <laughs> Well, I, I would argue that I'm even more of a dirty hippie, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> uh, my name is Shauna Redmond. I'm Associate Professor of Musicology and African American Studies at UCLA. Um, and I am, I would imagine myself to be even further removed from some of these types of conversations because I'm not graduate trained in any music field. Both of my graduate degrees are in interdisciplinary programs in African American studies and American studies. And so I've committed to a career of teaching music, but was never quite sure how musicologists, ethnomusicologists, music practitioners would read my work if they read it at all. Um, and I've been pleasantly surprised to find that they actually do. Um, hence the hiring in the UCLA School of Music. Um, so I started my career actually across the street at SC and I spent um, eight years there teaching in an American Studies department where I taught courses on music but I also taught to other of my investments and um, kind of research areas which include the African diaspora and social movements. Um, so I released a book, released like it was an album. I published a book, um, I wish. I published a book four years ago called Anthem, Social Movements and the Sound of Solidarity in the African Diaspora. And it's a book that tracks the songs that organize the black world in the 20th century. Um, so songs like Lift Every Voice and Sing, song, songs like We Shall Overcome, but also more popular anthems like Nina Simone's To Be Young, Gifted, and Black. Um, and so I'm interested broadly in how music becomes a method for communities in struggle toward self-determination, but also toward political speech in ways that are not always only interested in responding to the police or to the state in some kind of formal way, but are interested in developing certain types of solidarities amongst their communities, that these songs become a different type of way in which people identify themselves in relationship to each other. And one of my arguments is that singing and performing becomes a citizenship practice amongst the African descended in particular, but for many dispossessed communities around the world. Um, so more recently, um, I've been teaching courses at UCLA now exclusively around music, which is amazing for me after eight years of doing many things. Um, so I teach a course called Music and Politics, but I also teach some more genre-based courses around the blues um, and other types of black musics. But my research has recently taken me in directions more towards thinking through the metaphysics of sound and performance. Um, so I've been focusing a lot on Paul Robeson um, and thinking about the ways in which the singing body actually becomes manifest through different types of metaphysical states, such as vibration, or hologram or the built environment. And so trying to think in really complicated ways around what the voice as a particular instrument might accomplish in the world beyond the literal body standing in front of us. How does it otherwise reverberate or manifest itself beyond those areas or re of reach or access? So I'm very happy to be here and I look forward to the conversations to come. Well, uh, I have no academic credentials whatsoever. I went to Oberlin Conservatory and I have a bachelor's of music in vocal performance. But um, I discovered uh, I discovered a penchant for research and wanting to know more um, after I left the classical world and discovered the banjo and wondered when I figured out that it was an African American instrument why the image of the banjo is the, the uh, Beverly Hillbillies and what happened. And when I met Joe Thompson, uh, who was an 86-year-old African-American fiddler, um, I realized there was a, an enormous story here that was not being told. Joe being the last of a long, long line, um, numerous line of African-American string band musicians who used to be, who were the foundation to the music that then is the foundation to many of the genre specific musics that we, you know, celebrate today and that took over the world, you know, blues and jazz and rock and roll. And uh, when I realized how big of a gap there was in the knowledge, I started to read. And then once you start reading, you just really can't stop. And there's been an amazing amount of uh, incredible research that has been done by numerous people. Um, and so I've been reading a combination of history books and musicological books, but really the history books more, because I wanted to know the context. 
And so what I've been doing is, I, I kind of consider myself the performing arts arm of the research community. Yeah. Because what I do is I read the books and I synthesize them, and they've been synthes and synthesize them into songs, which I then perform in a context that I talk about on stage. And what, I, what I've noticed is that people are coming up to me and they're saying, they're not saying shut up. They're saying, we love the history, tell us more. And so I find that there is a hunger for the real truth of America. And so the more that I've dug into the music, the more that I've researched, um, I have found that it, you know, people are surprised, for example, uh, what happened with the election. But the more that you read into music history, the more you find that there is no surprise there. You know, because when I, when I looked into why the banjo went from being, everybody knew it was a black instrument, why people didn't even play it, to everybody knows it's a white instrument, black people don't play the banjo. And it happened in about 30 years. And it happened on purpose. It happened, it's just like reconstruction getting deconstructed. It didn't just fall apart. It didn't just disappear. So anyway, that's been my research and now, you know, I, I've been trying to explain to people that old time music and bluegrass music, it's not about getting diversity into it, it's, it's about recovering the black and colored and native contributions that were always there. You know, we invented calling. You know, square dance is, square dance is lifted up as the, the most purest white ethnic form, and it's not. Yeah, at all. You know, it's that kind of thing that I've been researching, and now I'm connecting things to southern Italy and Sicily, which was ruled by the Moors for 400 years, and you have all of this Arabic and North African music getting into European music, and nobody likes to talk about it, and then it comes over and meets, you know, it's just there's a lot, there's a lot, a lot to, to, to dig into. So I just kind of find the ones that make sense to me as a banjo playing, um, you know, person, and uh, try to synthesize them into music and then I just started speaking about it which is uh, still weird but um, any way that I can help I, 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 I once saw um, The Half Has Never Been Told you know this book um, Ed Baptist like uh, he came to a show and I venerated this book along with a lot of other books and, and I saw him and he, he introduced himself to me I know he's never seen a groupie like I was, I was just like, oh my God, you know, freaking out. And I'm like, this is, you know, but he's, that's what he said. He was like, you're taking what we're doing and getting it to a different audience. And so that's what I feel like. I'm a researching musician. Ooh, I'll shut up now. Wonderful. Well, th thanks to all of you. Thank you. We go again around uh, the semicircle and talk about how you got to where you are. I know each of you have uh, uh, really fascinating stories about that. And uh, after uh, uh, we've gone around again, I'd like to open up uh, the room to questions uh, so you can field questions. So it'll be uh, all of your chance to participate uh, out in your life. So I have a feeling that my journey might be the longest, um, purely by age, uh, in that uh, I was born in 1963 in Oakdale, California, which is the middle of the Central Valley of California, uh, close to Modesto, there were about 8,000 people there. Uh, it was known as the cowboy capital of the world. Uh, none of my family was musical. My grandmother did like to conduct classical music with a coffee spoon. Uh, that was a big thing. I was very eclectic background. My mom was 18 when she had me, so she was listening to the Beatles and Pink Floyd. And my grandmother was listening to Harry Belafonte and Liza Minnelli and Tchaikovsky. Uh, so it was a, that was my background. There was no reason really to suspect that I would go into music, except that I really loved it. Um, I went to UC Davis to become a veterinarian, and uh, <laughs> so loved animals. And uh, the, I should point out that Oakdale has a thing called the Testicle Festival, which is really kind of awful. Uh, they, uh, could go all, well, I think we're in the middle of a historic moment of Testicle Festival, but let's see. <laughs> In Oakdale, uh, this meant you know a, a calf testicle fry where you eat them. I never ate them, um, and and I got out and I went to, to Davis and at some point decided that um, 
the, the musical arts were more interesting at some level. So I started taking music theory courses and continued to sing in choirs. And uh, at some point I decided that the history was really interesting to me. So I always loved singing. I loved music theater especially. Uh, but the history was very compelling. And when I was, I guess, end of my junior year, I went to speak to the chairperson of the department at that time. And I said, hi, I'm Christy Brown. And he said, oh, yeah, the one with the good grades, which was the only <laughs> way. It was a very small department in Davis. There was no graduate degree at that time. And uh, I said, yeah, I think I'd like to be a musicologist. And he was a musicologist. And he said, well, you know, kind of see you as the girl who would introduce the operas on TV. It's <laughs> not what you really go in as your counseling session. Um, so I ended up eventually becoming his research assistant and I went down to UC Berkeley, which at the time had the highest ranked musicology department in the country. And one of the first conversations I had with a musicologist there was, well, we kind of have a woman problem here. And I just felt like this was continuing. There were no female professors at Davis in music for musicology, and there were none at Berkeley for musicology. Um, so I continued and took a year off to go to Italy to sing some, to come back and decided I'll, continue, I'll go ahead and do the PhD. And then I got married and I got pregnant. And I might as well have fallen. I mean, I literally... It was like, that's it. Everybody assumed game was over. And I would like to say, especially there was no model for this. There are no women to tell me you can do this, that, and the other thing. So I would, this is something I now brag about, which at the time seemed like almost like a, you don't want to talk about it. I had two children and finished a dissertation in five years. It, I mean, now I understand how unusual it was, uh, and I'm pleased to say that my 25-year-old daughter is now a high school teacher of history, um, and that's so I gave back to the, the larger <laughs> educational mission. But she was really part of the spontaneous reason I, I really looked at, at Mozart operas and why I ended up with opera, where the stories were compelling to me. And they tend to center around women, but I saw a lot of problems with both the stories themselves and the way that the stories were written about. Mm -hmm. So there were two things that came up. One, I was watching the Magic Flute, Bergman's film version. My daughter's four years old, and she looks at me and she said, is the queen a good lady or a bad lady? Mm -hmm. And I thought, that is like, that is the question of the century right there, little girl. And, but then she said, and why did that man take the daughter away from her mommy? And it was such a, like, just out of this child. But the second thing that got me was a 1977 book on the operas of Mozart published by Oxford University Press, recommended in 1991 as, as reading for Don Giovanni when it was put on during the Mozart year by the Metropolitan Opera, in which William Mann, the author, wrote a lot of nasty things about Donna Anna, ending with the fact that um, you know, she doesn't know how to love anybody except for horses and lap dogs, and it would have benefited her personal growing up had she been pleasantly raped by Don Giovanni. And this is not a fringe author. This was a renowned music critic. This was a major university press in the middle of the 70s. And I read that in the 90s, and I see it recommended, and it was kind of like game was on. So I'm a different kind of hippie in my context because, number one, I'm, there's a huge resistance toward opera being redefined in any way. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a thing that's very well protected by both women and men mm -hmm. um, and resistant to any kind of critique about it. I also work in a conservatory in which I am the only female full-time faculty member at this time. And um, I, during one meet and greet at the beginning, everybody has to show up, an administration, everybody has to show up to this one thing. Uh, the, I can't remember, what, we, we all get together, all the students, all the faculty, all the administration, and a teacher who I will not name, but got up and said, uh, you know, we're the greatest performing arts school in the world, Pate Oberlin, because you know, I still count, because they have a different idea of what's great. 
Uh, and he said, so if you want to be a musicologist, there's the door. Mm -hmm. Which was kind of like, had I been closer, it would have been, okay. <laughs> A typical way I went, woo! You know, I kind of got the whole thing, but I was embarrassed. And so there is that kind of fighting as a, I now realize part, you know, I'm now a senior scholar in many people's eyes. I have a daughter I want to be a model for. I have a, I don't care anymore. I feel comfortable to speak out. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got to this place, sitting in the Doheny. <laughs> about women in opera at 3.30 in the Amat House. It's across the campus. Okay, so how far back? I was born and raised in Iran, actually, and I was a trained classical pianist. My life mission was to go to the conservatory and play piano for the rest of my life. Um, I did go to music school. I moved to France when I was 18, and I continued playing piano. And then at some point, I was like, I don't want to do this. This is too stressful. This is not something. It just, I mean, it gradually got to that pressure point that um, if I don't find an ensemble or an orchestra to be part of, I can't pay my rent. And this thing is too competitive. And I, this is not, is taking away the passion. What I wanted to be in the passion was turning into this profession and a job that I didn't want to do. Looking back, if I were a bit older, I think I would have made a different decision, and if I had more financial security, I'd probably made other decisions. So I kind of closed that door and, and didn't play piano for 10 years, and moved to California and started taking, I went to college, not knowing what I want to do, just taking classes in journalism, in history, any, you name it. And, and I sat in a, in a neuroscience class, and it was really fascinating and interesting. And I always had an interest in child development with the sense of, um, if we can help children and make a difference in their life when they're young, that's probably the most effective way of um, changing adults later. So we cannot eliminate stress from children's life, we cannot eliminate all the wars and, and poverty, but if we can teach them tools that they can respond to these stressors, um, hopefully that will have a more positive effect. So started working at a brain laboratory and I was really interested um, as a research assistant and it was a laboratory that did auditory neuroscience. So Basically, they worked with anything auditory-wise, speech, language, and then it kind of like got to me that, well, music is a form of auditory stimulus, and I always knew what music did for me growing up in, in a country that at the time was in war and kind of provided me a, a safe space and a place to um, learn how to communicate my emotions and kind of uh, be with myself, but also... Uh, have a way to connect with others um, through music. So when it when I started my PhD, I kind of like looking for. In that sense, I was, I'm kind of like a, a too because I was talking to neuroscientists who want to study music, and they're like, "Okay, this doesn't exist. You're joking. Just go study some normal way of neuroscience, kind of like cell biology." Um, and I finally convinced a dissertation advisor that I ended up working with that no, I really want to understand what music does. Like, what is it about music? It's this organized pattern of sound, and what is it about that that actually has the power to elicit these strong emotions? Like, what does it do in the brain? So he decided to take a chance, and I did my uh, dissertation at UC Irvine looking at um, kind of brain differences between adult musicians and non-musicians who have had long-term music training. So just kind of starting from when you have 10 to 20 years of music training, what does it do for your brain? Um, what kind of protective mechanisms does it have? Does it protect you from dementia or other uh, diseases in older age? And um, and from there, seeing the differences, I was just really interested to bring it back to the question that, okay, now we have, I learn about what this tool does for adults. What if we look at in children? And that's how, um, again, starting at, at USC was kind of not a concept that I was worked with, but I brought it up to my um, institute director and I said, I want to understand what music does for children. And there are neuroscientists that are open-minded and are willing to take a chance, and I was really lucky to be put in touch with some of these people throughout my career, and they're like, okay, yeah, 
and we'll do this. And so we've been able to kind of get funding for this study and, and follow the kids. Um, but yeah, it's a really kind of the path. So music has been always in my life. I recently started playing piano again, not professionally, but um, but just kind of um, seeing what can this do for children and their families. I'll speak at 4.30 in the Ahmad House. That's again across the campus. For the sake of equity, moving forward, uh, I'm going to ask you to, keep, uh, to um, say something about three to four minutes, just so you have a sense of it so that everyone gets to present, and then we can have a few field a few questions at the end. I'm sorry for those of you who have less time. <laughs> Um, okay, well, um, let's see, I'm from Syracuse, New York, which usually when I tell people that, they say, oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a gloomy place with lots of uh, snow, rain, um, it's a Rust Belt town, and um, I'm first generation, or I was a first generation college student, and later master student and PhD student in my family, um, so I kind of just fell into a lot of things, going by what interested me. Um, growing up, I was really into storytelling, I was really into science fairs that I did willingly, many times, voluntar voluntarily, um, and I played violin, and um, when I was choosing colleges, I was trying to figure out, well, what do I want to do? And I was really into science, I almost went into you know biotechnology or environmental science, and I decided, well, I gave up on soccer years ago, I don't want to give up on violin, so I went, the practical route of music education. And um, and then while I was at uh, Potsdam at the Crane School of Music, uh, I got really into learning um, Spanish. So I was monolingual when I was growing up. Um, I now speak three kind of and a half languages um, that I studied through school. And I wanted to get to know more about my family, my background. Um, I used a research project as a, my senior thesis um, to go to Mexico, meet my family, and learn about mariachi music, which I had never heard before I was 21, and I just knew, well, they have violins in it, and I play violin, and I'm going to go meet my family, so this is cool. Um, <laughs> so um, I did that, and then I wanted to always come to California, um, ended up coming out to UCLA for grad school, uh, following my, my grandmother's path, and you know, my grandmother from uh, Massachusetts and my grandfather from Mexico met uh, working at a cafe in Glendale. And then went back to New York. New York. <laughs> so I always wanted to come out here, scope it out. Uh, went to UCLA while I was doing my research on indigenous music in um, northern Ecuador uh, with uh, Quechua musicians. Um, I really missed playing mariachi, and I saw mariachis all over the place in parts of northern Ecuador, of all places. So um, I joined a band and sort of did that as a hobby and to make friends and feel connected. And um, then I went in 2014, played uh, mariachi music in Cuba, and realized how popular it was there and um, I was lucky enough to get a, a job where I didn't have to move too far away so I'm just down the road in Pomona um, teaching mariachi and that's how I sort of jumped from indigenous music to research with mariachi music and that's where I'm at. So. <laughs> The short, long story goes something like this. My mother um, is a retired English literature professor and she also um, spent many years playing in Baptist churches. She read music, she played hymns, played gospel and all that. And so I was not planned. And when she found out she was pregnant, she felt that guy told her her kid was going to be musical. And so she went out and bought a piano. And like, <laughs> clearly I wouldn't be able to play it for some years. But she went out and got a <laughs> piano. And then like, I got like a toy piano for Christmas and all that. And so um, I started pe um, classical piano lessons at four. I started singing in church maybe at three. And so in violin and viola, somewhere around nine or 10, went to performing arts school. I grew up in West Palm Beach, Florida. Um, um, school yards from 7th to 12th grade and really how I got here is all about what happened in 7th to 12th grade. I have mixed emotions about um, arts intensive programs for young people. I think I was one of those kids I was doing it because I enjoyed it. I loved it. I liked the applause. That was cool too. Um, but uh, being in art school became really like competitive and sucked all of the fun out of it. Suddenly I went from doing this thing because I enjoyed it to having to take lessons and practice four hours a day at the age of like 12. And so um, I say that I'm a, I used to say that I'm an ex-musician, um, but 
ironically, or not so ironically, teaching at a conservatory has like brought me back to um, my own musical practice. And even when I went to college, and I went to a historically black college um, in Florida as well, um, I took piano lessons on campus, I taught piano lessons on the side, so it never fully, fully left me. But um, the other, I think, well, no, I, not I think, I know. When I was in seventh and twelfth grade, I was doing classical piano. And I really wanted to do jazz piano. I was gung-ho about this. I enjoyed everything about the big band. I wanted to do that. And my teacher, a man, was like, no, Chopin and Brahms for you. And I was really angry, but there was no way out of that. And I think that too, um, not being able to communicate musically in the language that meant the most to me at the time. Um, also, my interest in gospel was dissuaded in another way because that was seen as not serious. Like, you can't go to school with that. So I think those scars actually um, have profoundly affected how I teach and why I teach. And then when I got to graduate school in ethnomusicology, my advisor uh, she said when we first got there, more than whatever your genre interest may be, if you know people were interested in hip hop, techno, whatever, she was like, you really need to learn the arc of the narrative of African American music from West, uh, you know, uh, the, the Western coast of Africa up until the present. You really need to have a sense for how to put all these different sounds and these p periods and these people together in some kind of. Um, a way that makes emotional sense and intellectual sense. And that's probably the most profound, that statement probably had the most profound impact on how I approach what I teach. Um, and it worked out perfectly since I ended up teaching an intro to African American music class that is a year. Um, and so I, I'm always looking at what we're not elevating. I ask my students all the time how we know what we know um, and what is left out of that story. You were mentioning about who writes about this music. It matters mm -hmm. that I ask my students, well, what biographies of jazz musicians have you written? All of them are written by men and they're all about men, right? <laughs> and that has to shape how we think about this music, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I think my story, is, it, as it is, continues to evolve, is one about um, taking those wounds that happened to me and trying to make sure that they don't happen and that that people who are in positions of power don't continue to perpetuate them and that people who are not in power don't continue to suffer from them. You can hear Frederica give a talk uh, this afternoon in the Donahue Center. It's across the street here um, at 5.30 p.m. So I grew up a very introspective and nerdy child in the Midwest, and I spent a lot of time alone with music, never really recognizing its significance until it was removed from me. Turn that off, go to bed, whatever the issue was. And I had working parents, and so we spent a lot of time in the car, commuting between sitters and jobs and family and other things. And, and the radio was a, a solace for me in those moments. Um, and so I played an instrument, multiple of them, um, and invested in that way, but didn't really recognize what me meaning-making possibilities were inside of the music until I went to college and I started to pursue something else. Um, I started to pursue African American studies which gripped me right away as soon as I got to campus. I started asking questions about the world around me. I started to study with a labor historian who would take me to strikes in the Twin Cities, who would talk to me about organizing. Um, and I wanted to figure out how to merge that practice of social and political investment with the music making, recognizing increasingly that they were not separate practices, that both were happening in collision with each other all of the time. So I actually became a double major in music in college. That's my one music degree. Um, I trained as a vocalist and then decided that I wanted to be a professional nerd and went to go get my PhD. <laughs> and I knew that going into a music college program or a music program was probably going to be too narrow for my interests actually. 
actually, that I needed to go into an interdisciplinary program that was going to challenge me to be historical, to be ethnographic, to be political, to be invested in popular culture, canon formation, all of these different things. And I'm very glad that I actually pursued that route because that expansiveness actually then allowed me to read music in a very different way. So I came to understand that the languages, the performance practices, the types of socialities that are developed through music making actually mean something incredibly dense and rich for the people who participate in them and listen to them. Hence, moving toward this project on black social movements and the music that was produced from them, but also trying to then use that as a practice in my teaching and make that evident for students who come to my classes now in the School of Music expecting to hear one thing and hear something radically different, actually, that I'm challenging them on who they are, not just through the meanings of the music that we listen to. We're not reading scores in my classes. We're actually talking about how these songs are used. Do they appear in the streets? What does it mean if they're on the radio? Who's not on the radio? What other means do we come to these other types of musics and musicians that actually matter to the way that we live in the world? So I try to teach my students that if you listen differently, you think differently. If you think differently, you live differently. And if you live differently, the world changes. And all of that is connected, that your listening practice, your music making practice matters in the world that we develop in front of us every single day. That's the possibility in the world. And so I went from introspective nerdy child to less introspective, but increasingly as nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> Join Shauna as she gives a talk at um, 4.30 p.m. in the Donahue Center, which is across the road here. Well, fellow nerd here, mm -hmm. um, obsessive nerd, and I mention it because it, it is why I'm here today. Um, I started off, you know, in a mixed household in the South. You know, my parents uh, got married three years after loving. Um, and uh, got divorced right after I was born. So it was shuttling back and forth between the black and the white side of a working class North Carolina. And uh, they were pretty similar. Um, and then the, the, the grandma who watched Hee Haw was the black one. Yeah. So, <laughs> I kind of grew up with the idea of the back and forth and, you know, and figuring out who I was. And that sort of laid the groundwork for everything that followed and also my obsessiveness. So, you know, I was, um, I ended up going to Oberlin because I, I, I went to a school of math and science boarding school for high school um, and quickly realized that I didn't want to do math or science <laughs> and so I started an acapella group at this high school and it was like maybe I should go into music and um, I didn't know how to read music or anything I'd been in a choir and you know sung with my family but um, I, I saw an opera on TV and I was like ooh they sing all the time in opera that sounds cool I want to be an opera singer <laughs> and so I, I auditioned you know I, I did two auditions and um, I had I got into Oberlin, and I went. You know, I got. I, I went there because they were opera, and I was like, a musical theater. They have to speak. I don't want to speak. I want to do opera. So I, I went to Oberlin, and I fell in love with Western art music. I just completely was in the front row because I wasn't doing math and science. I was so excited. I was like, all I have to do is music. Oh my god! And so I became obsessed, and I read about it, and I listened, and I went to everybody's recital. I had a stack of recital programs. This this time, you know, when I left Oberlin, and I learned so much. It was like a five-year crash course in Western art music. Wow, I wish you'd been there, because I didn't get nothing from the other side. I got nothing. You know what I mean? It was like, but I, I got a lot of Western art music. It was incredible, and I, and I love it. But I burned out, and I came home, and I got into Celtic music. My name is Welsh, and uh, I got a lot of, you know, I, I started going out with a guy you know, who's a fluent Gaelic speaker, so I started getting into that history, and I learned, started learning Gaelic, and didn't realize that there were black Gaelic speakers. I was like, what? <laughs> North Carolina, you know? there was a black church that sent off for a Gallic preacher and I was just like, ah, oh, blew my mind and I started thinking about like, what is culture? What is race? What is like, you know, if you speak Gallic and you are living a Gallic cultural, why are you not 
why is that why is that not your your identity you know if you're black what what does that matter in terms of it's just the color of your skin you know what i mean so it's just like started investigating that and then i got into basically whatever i fell into i fell hard went to scotland studied with gallic speakers you know and learned that music and um then i got into a time string band and you know, met Joe, and that was it. My heart was, you know, I started learning fiddle and banjo in my 20s, and um, didn't know how hard the fiddle was, and I'm really glad, because I would have put it down immediately. Um, <laughs> by the time I figured it out, I was hooked. And I started playing, you know, and, and, and Joe, he was the last of his family to, to play this music, and, and he was from my grandmother's hometown. I had never heard of him, I couldn't believe it, and you know, he knew my family, and we're probably related somewhere, and you know, he passed on his legacy of black string band music to me and my, my bandmates, the Carolina Chocolate Drops, and um, so, upset, so I started obsessing about the, the, the history and the culture, and you know, that became my mission. So when I went solo, and, and that's always been the mission, is, it, is finding the real history, because genres are fake. Genres are put upon. That was put upon by the recording industry to sell records. They made a decision. It's colored records, or, 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 and, and it's hillbilly records. You know, they did that. We come together through music. You know, the, the American music is a long history of white and black and indigenous cultural exchange that has gone back and forth. Now, who's profited from it? Yeah, we all know that. That's on mostly one side. But in terms of this pure art itself, it has been a, cult, a constant, you know, constant conversation. And so that's what I'm trying to highlight is that in trying to, trying to break down those artificial divisions, we realize that this is where we reach out to each other is through the art. You know, and so now um, I'm, I'm wrapping it up. So now, uh, <laughs> so now was, I, I'm, I'm working in. Uh, I'm actually starting to compose, and so I'm writing. I think it's the first ballet that has a black prima ballerina that is for specifically has to be a black ballerina, and it's about um, uh, Black Lucy. It's from Lucy Negro Redux. It's a, it's a book of poetry, and uh, so it's going to be about the, the woman who may have some inspired Shakespeare to write the Dark Lady sonnets. And so, and I'm also was com um, commissioned to write an opera um, about uh, a Muslim um, scholar who was captured and sold into slavery um, from uh, Senegambia into and ended up in North Carolina. Um, so I'm trying to, to to push the needle also the other way. I'm trying to, you know, let's add some stuff to the canon that's talking about this stuff, you know. Um, and I appreciate the people who are willing to give me a shot to do that, having never taken a compositional class in my life. Um, so it'll be interesting, but uh, that's where I'm at right now. Discussion. I'm afraid we're out of time, uh, and so you're going to have to, if you'd like to ask questions of our participants, please attend their talks. They're each uh, 45 minutes each, 40 minutes each. There'll be time to ask them questions then. I think we're going to look forward to hearing uh, what your questions are. Uh, next up, we're going to have a uh, master class with young uh, women uh, performers. Each is going to play for you uh, and show you some of their art, and Rhiannon is going to uh, mentor them and guide them along in developing that art. Thank you all uh, for your participation.